गुड इवनिंग सर good evening everyone we will be waiting for two more minutes for uh, to let more people join and then we'll be starting our today's session if anyone has questions from these this week's lectures then you can just post it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask otherwise we'll just go ahead Okay. Uh, am I visible and audible? So you are audible to us and visible also. Okay. We'll just go ahead and we'll share my screen. I hope you can see the uh, PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is visible, right? You can just text in the chat if you see the PowerPoint or not. So I welcome you all to the week three PMRF NPTEL session on animal physiology. 
uh, in this week we have dealt with the muscles and how exactly muscles are formed as well as how exactly muscles work especially looking into the fine molecular detail of functioning of muscles especially the power stroke as well as different aspect anatom anatomical aspects of muscles such as the orientation of the sarcomere as well as the interlinking of myosin and actin all of this is what we are going to discuss this week and solve problems on so as you would know the uh, pmr capitol sessions are designed in order to solve various problem questions from previous years assignments of these same courses so we are doing the same assignment questions from week 3 animal physiology run of the epitel course in the previous year that is what we are trying to solve and in order uh, by doing that and uh, we are going to be able to solve and tackle this year's assignment questions and course work easily that is the plan Uh, let me briefly introduce myself my name is anurag chatterji i am a prime minister research fellow and a phd scholar at developmental neurobiology lab department of biological sciences and bioengineering indian institute of technology kanpur i am the pmrf ta one of the pmrf ta's for this course and i will be hosting the, uh, this session okay and as you had previously seen all of these uh sessions are recorded and the recordings are uploaded to youtube for someone to access at a later point if you have missed the session or want to just go back and go through another uh, this one point again then you can just go ahead and go to this playlist you can search it on youtube this is also available on your course page as well so you can do that as well so i will be quickly asking if anyone has any questions from this week's a uh, course work then we can tackle that or we'll just go ahead to solving questions no sir okay if no one has any questions then we'll go ahead with this week's uh, question answer session okay so how we do this is that uh, we have a question on the board uh, we will be trying to solve this and i would encourage everyone to think about the question and put whatever you think a b c d is the correct answer in the chat then we'll be discussing about the question and the concept behind it and then answer the questions so everyone i would like you to try and answer this uh, first question which is dash are myocardial cells the options are neurons pacemaker cells beta islets or nephrons the options are a b c d whichever you think you can put into the chat vishwajit uh, and atit both uh, are putting in b pacemaker cells antara is also uh, putting in b pacemaker cells anyone else anyone else wants to try and answer this Neuron. Okay, when I says it is a neuron. Anyone else wants to try? Almudina says it is B pacemaker cells. Okay. okay so let us try and answer this so this part of uh, our discussion we have not reached to different parts of the heart in our current series but uh, this i will just go through quickly so this is a heart we will probably be discussing about how the heart functions at a later point in the series uh, in the actual epitel course but i will just give you a quick flow through so this is what the heart looks like we have two major uh, 
blood vessels going through the heart one is the aorta and one is the pulmonary uh, the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary vessel the heart is divided as you would know into the four halves the right and left uh, atrial valves and the right and left uh, ventricular valves further the heart essentially is a, a huge muscle which has different parts which could include the sinoatrial node which are known as the pacemaker cells present right at the top of the left towards the heart this is where the essentially the rhythm of beating of the heart is generated and as you can see uh, this indicates that the first part of the heart to start beating is the right atrium followed by the left uh, followed by the right ventricle left atrium and line, uh, left ventricle this is how the flow of current through the heart flow goes and how exactly it beats so next we neuron is the correct answer for that no because myocardium is they are showing that neuron over there so they answer na so myocardium when we are talking about myo we mean muscle cardium means heart so we are talking about heart muscles hmm. so we are this is now we do not have essentially neurons we have neurons that innervate the heart but they are not essentially part of the musculature of the heart those include cells such as the pacemaker cells or the vascular smooth muscles or the endocardium or the myocardium i will even give you purkinje cells for it purkinje cells are kind of neuron like cells but uh, they are not essentially neurons so Sir, the answer will be pacemaker cells no yes the answer is pacemaker cells so uh, there is also important another important node so this is a node of cells which sets the rhythm for the uh, heart and the important node in the body heart is the av node the atrioventricular node this node is important because it prevents the flow of current too fast towards the left ventricle so if you think about it just the basic basic introduction to this how the heart works is that the right atrium receives blood it pushes into the right ventricle but pushes the blood into the lungs via the pulmonary uh via the pulmonary vesicle uh or the pulmonary i trunk so uh, once this goes towards the lungs it is oxygenated comes back to the left atrium and then finally to the left ventricle from which it is pumped throughout the body so the chronological order of beating of the pump is right atrium right ventricle left atrium and left ventricle how this uh, so but we only have one node which sets the pace for the entire heart so the electrical activity would start here and once the electrical activity reaches the particular compartment it will compress so technically what should have happened is that in the right and the uh, right atrium and the left atrium should have beaten at almost the same time or the right ventricle or the left ventricle what the atrioventricular node does is that it slows down the signal so that when the electrical impulse flows through the heart's walls it is slowed here so that the left ventricle receives the electrical impulses at the last moment so that it beats at the last uh, last of all the four compartments which is how the entire heart should work so two important nodes we have one is the sinoatrial node or the second one is the atrioventricular node and we have all the four compartments so if we go to back to our questions a dash and myocardial cells the important answer is pacemaker cells anyone has any questions from this no sir okay so vishwajit raised his hand do you have any question Uh, <clears throat> sir uh, so myocardial uh, means uh, uh, i mean what does it means so 
does it mean uh, first uh, uh, first cell uh, that uh, gives signal i mean gives signal to beat uh, our, uh, left ventricle uh, okay so what myocardial means is if you divide the two terms myo means muscle cardial means heart so essentially the heart, muscles that make up the heart it does not indicate any particular okay. cell per se so anything okay. out of all the four so technically um, the heart is not made out of neurons beta uh-huh. islets are present in the pancreas nephrons are present in the kidneys so essentially yeah. this was a eliminate all type of a question so only the answer okay. remains is pacemaker okay okay sir beta islets were present in which uh, Pancreas, uh, the islets of Langerhans. Mm-hmm. The beta cells from their re- uh, release insulin. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so moving on. Uh, the next question, more with more according to what we have learned in the last uh, NPTEL videos, arteries are made out of which of the following? The options are smooth muscles. skeletal muscles cardiac muscles or all of the above you can put what you think is correct in the chat matrudatta says it is smooth muscles anyone else wants to try vinayak also says it is smooth muscles almadina says it is a atik says it is a Vishwajit also says it is A. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Sir, I am having question on this question. No. Okay. What is your question on this question? Uh, the cardiac muscle. are because arteries are made up of smooth muscle right so the cardiac muscle uh, veins and arteries which comes from cardiac muscles towards the body uh, those are also made up from smooth muscle only no yes cardiac muscles only compose of the heart exactly the heart the muscles that beat to produce the lub dub sound in our heart and pump blood Arteries which start just at the heart also are made out of smooth muscles. Okay. So Antara also has said A. So we'll go ahead and look into this. So there are three types. Ty- so types of muscles we can divide into three major parts. The first are skeletal muscles, which look something like this. These are multi-nucleated muscles, which are cylindrical in nature and appear as hollow tubes or rather fill tubes from one end to the other you can see right here they have multiple nuclei and are striated what i mean by striated is that they have this striation patterns or lengthwise patterns along them that you can see right here and the second type of muscles we see is the cardiac muscle which is multinucleated It looks like looks a bit similar to skeletal muscles, but has less striations or a different type of striations, and also are made out of hollow tubes that go through, uh, like encompass the entire heart. So the, uh, essentially, fill tubes. Yeah. And finally, we have smooth muscles, which are a bit different from both. They do not have any striations, and each of them are uninucleated. That is, uh, all the cells have one nuclei each. and uh, skeletal muscles are obviously present associated with our skeleton and help in movement of the skeleton and are closely associated with it cardiac muscles are exclusively present in our heart and finally smooth muscles are present essentially everywhere else uh, in our and line different uh, tubes in our body such as the elementary canal where there is requirement of muscles to push the food through and help in digestion that is entirely made out of smooth muscles or our arteries are are also made out of smooth muscles 
Uh, so we'll quickly go through a comparison between all of this. So body location, as I said, skeletal muscles are attached to bones and skins of the face. The cardiac muscles are, are entirely exclusively make up the walls of the heart and smooth muscles make up the walls of other hollow organs such as the stomach and the alimentary canal. And this also includes arteries. Or uh, cell shape and appearance. Skeletal muscles appear single, so a single long chain of cells joined together, very long, cylindrical, they have a striated pattern as you can see right here, a, a, a perpendicular line-like pattern in this cylinder of cells and are multinucleate, all of these are multiple nuclei. Cardiac muscles on the other hand have a branching structure as you can see right here. They are not a single tube like structure but branch. Uh, they have striations also but the striations are a bit different than our skeletal muscles and are uninucleated. Finally, the smooth muscles, they are single, fusiform meaning they are joined together. They have no striations and are uninucleated. You can see that the image is here. Skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And finally, regulation of contraction. Skeletal muscles are voluntary. We can regulate and control them via our, our, uh, via our nervous system. The cardiac is involuntary. This goes on without any input from our conscious mind. The heart has a pacemaker which sets the rhythm, which is known as the uh, SA node. And finally, we have smooth muscles which is also involuntary you do not actually command the food to go down your elementary canal that is uh, always automatic so the it is involuntary in nature but can be controlled via hormones or other chemical situations any question from this No, sir. Okay. So smooth muscles are made, uh, arteries are made out of smooth muscles. Everyone fine with this? Okay. Moving on. So very similar question. Which of the following of these are non-striated? The options are skeletal muscles, cardiac muscles, smooth muscle, and rough muscle. You can put what you think is correct in the chat. So what is the meaning of striated and non-striated muscle? Mm, I will just show you. So you see this, if you see the skeletal muscles which go from left to right, like yeah. looking like cylinders, these stripe-like patterns on them, which go perpendicularly, ah. which look like uh, stripes on a zebra or stripes on a tiger. Ah. In that, a particular manner, they were having that lines. Yeah, these lines. These are what we call a striated pattern. Something what a zebra and would the have. The muscle is not having that, no. Cardiac muscles do have that. So you can see striations here. Hmm. Here, so smooth muscles thing. do not have striations. Uh, okay. So the question, coming back to this, uh, no, this was done. Which of these is non-striated, skeletal, cardiac, smooth, or important word non-striated? Which of them will not have the striated pattern? You can put what you think is correct in the chat. Almadina says it is smooth, Antara says it is C, smooth, Atik says C, Vishwajit also says it is C. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Fatima also says it is C, smooth muscle. 
sir how cardiac muscle because cardiac muscles are now also showing some of the lines no but not in a proper way but mm -hmm. they were showing the lines no yes the question is which of these is non striat which will not have the lines in them line like pattern yes uh, so just quickly going back to this this is a striation pattern we are talking about these vv line like things going perpendicular to the direction of the muscles these are what we call striations so as you can see right here skeletal muscles have a lot of striations cardiac muscles also do have striations but smooth muscles do not have any striations so which of the following is non striated the correct answer is smooth muscle okay moving on to from the tissue level we will now be discussing exclusively about the molecular level of uh, muscle function and these two guys are very very important in that aspect these are two molecules actin and myosin which essentially generate all the forces required for muscle movement and muscle contraction so the first question posed towards you is that actin and myosin are which of the following types of molecules a carbohydrates b proteins c fats d all of the above andra says it is b proteins vishwadeep says it is b atik also says it is b sibani says it is b and she also agrees that it is b proteins anyone else want to try into the chat what do you think is the correct answer al madina also says it is b anyone else wants to try answer this confused in the option not getting the answer you are getting confused in the option so yeah so we will just go and see the discussion once so this is what the structure of a muscle looks like so as we had seen in our uh, course videos the muscle is a huge structure made out of tier upon tier of a uh, coiling of different things so first the muscle if you cut it open you will see it is made out of various small cylindrical uh, structures these cylindrical structures are muscle fibers if you look closely into the muscle fiber you, uh, you will be looking into uh, even smaller uh, cylindrical structure if you look at that that will be one myofibril one my uh yeah and if you even look even closer you will see a myo tube so muscle cut it open muscle fiber cut it open even further you have a myo tube and finally inside the myo tube you will e see even more cylindrical structures in a cross section which are the actin and the myosin so both actin and myosin are proteins these are the energy genetic mechanism of the muscles and essentially you see this entire thing is a iterative hierarchical arrangement which looks exactly the same so first the actin and myosin which come together to form the myofibril which come together to form the muscle fiber which finally form, comes together to form the muscles uh, so we'll be looking closely into actin and myosin in the upcoming slides but just give you a brief idea looking closely actin looks like this this image right here which is a intercoiled uh the yeah, so it looks uh, linearish and it is intercoiled among stress so this yellow part is the actin actin has two more 
proteins attached to it what is known as tropomyosin which goes which is also cylindrical and essentially follows the actin along its path so you can look at it as a double helix kind of structure and troponin which is a small protein which sits on some places throughout actin this is what actin strands look like next we have myosin myosin is a bigger uh, structure which has these long tails and two heads so these myosin molecules have two heads which look like a look like beans on a stalk so one tail and two heads both of they them come together to form the unit of the smallest functional unit of the muscle which is known as a sarcomere so we'll be discussing more on this but the structure looks like this the sarcomere functions like how it functions we'll be looking into that how sarcomere functions we have slides on that we'll go through extensively how exactly sarcomere functions and how exactly it generates the force required how it moves like yeah yeah we will go into this we will go into this i'm just showing you just an overview of what it looks like it looks like something like this there is a middle joining point which is known as a m line from which myosin extends on both ends the myosin is attached to actin like this which is in turn attached to another structure known as the z disk or the z line this is the entire the structure of the muscle you have a myosin in the middle with actin and uh, with actin on both ends and here is where the striated pattern of muscles come into play if you look closely in the middle uh, of the sarcomere there is very little stuff here just tails of the myosin through which light can easily pass through this is what we see as the light coloration in the uh, striated images in the muscle images but here where there is extensive overlap between the actin and the myosin this area appears dark so we have consecutively dark and light areas which give us a impression of the striated pattern are you guys following me is this okay Yes, but what I also ask you another question is: So yeah. the myosin filament, which is middle of the actin myofilament, yes, so yes. the myosin filament will move circularly inside the actin filament, no? No, it does not move circularly. It moves linearly on both ends. But we'll see how it occurs. So it essentially moves like this. If you can see my hands, ah. so this. is what the actin actin myosin pair looks like they move like this they interlink among them, themselves acha means like this muscles yes they move so away and when the, we just contract our muscles they be uh, come together yes the z essentially if you look at the z discs the knuckles of my palm are the z discs and these are the actin myosin rays they come together when we are contracting the muscles and move away when we are relaxing we will see how that works yeah anyone else has any questions from this okay so here we have a video which i will play and uh, this will give us information about how exactly myosin and actin work in order to generate force you guys just have to tell me if you can hear this video or not this video so what i've done here is i've what i want to do in this video is can try to understand this? how two proteins can interact with each other in conjunction with atp Can you hear this? No, sir. No. Okay. 
sir is this will be uh, this video will be coming on that uh, google drive your profile uh since this video will be embedded into the ppt so you can just go ahead and view this on your device just... what i want to do in this ppt profile is there in my google drive that folder yes. is there in share yes, yes. it it should then it should just be it you can just uh, look at it when we i share the ppt can you see this uh can you see this video what I want to do in this video is try to understand how two proteins can yeah. interact with each other. Properly. Yeah. The sound is okay? Uh, sound is audible. Okay. I'll just remove this and start the video. What I want to do in this video is try to understand how two proteins can interact with each other in conjunction with ATP to actually produce mechanical motion. And the reason why I want to do this one, it's, it's, it, it occurs outside of muscle cells as well, but this is really going to be the first video on really how muscles work. And then we'll talk about how nerves actually stimulate muscles to work. So it'll all build up from this video. So what I've done here is I've copy and pasted two images of proteins from Wikipedia. This is myosin. Myosin. It's actually myosin 2 because you actually have two strands of the my myosin protein. They're interwound around each other. So you can see it's this very complex looking protein or enzyme, however you want to talk about it. And I'll tell you why it's called an enzyme because it actually helps react ATP into ADP and phosphate groups. So that's why it's called an ATPase, or it's a it's a subclass of the ATPase enzymes. This right here is actin. This is actin. What we're going to see in this video is how myosin essentially uses the ATP to essentially crawl along. You can almost view it as an actin rope. And that's what creates mechanical energy. So let me draw it. I'll actually draw it on this actin right here. So let's say we have a myosin, one of these myosin heads. So when I say a myosin head, this is one of the myosin heads right here. And then it's connected, it's intertwined, and it's wove around. This is the other one, and it winds around that way. Now let's just say we're just dealing with one of the myosin heads. Let's say it's in this position. Let me see how well I can draw it. Let's say it starts off in a position that looks like that. And then this is its this is kind of the, the tail part that connects to some other structure. And we'll talk about that in more detail. But this is my myosin head right there, when it, in its starting position, not doing anything. Now. ATP can come along and bond to this myosin head, this enzyme, this protein, this ATPase enzyme. So let me draw some ATP. So let's say that that's, so ATP comes along and bonds to this guy right here. So let's say that's the, and it's not going to be this big relative to the protein, but this is just to give you the idea. So as soon as the ATP binds, to its appropriate site on this enzyme or protein. The enzyme, it detaches from the actin. So let me write this down. So one, ATP binds to myosin head. Myosin head. And as soon as that happens, that causes, that causes the myosin to release myosin releases releases actin so that's step 1 so i started off with these this guy just touching the actin the atp comes and it gets released so in the next step so that's so after that step it's going to look something like this and i want to draw it kind of in the same place so after the next step it's going to look something like this it will have released it will have released. So now let me shade it in with the white. So now it looks something like that. And you have the ATP attached to it still. I know it might be a little bit convoluted when I keep writing over the same thing. But you have the ATP attached to it. Now the next step, the ATP hydrolyzes. The phosphate gets pulled off of it. This is, that's, this is an ATP ACE enzyme. That's what it does. So let me write that down. So step two, let me scroll down a little bit. Step two, ATP goes to ADP plus a phosphate group. And what that does, 
that releases the energy to cock this myosin protein into kind of a high energy state. So let me do step two. So step two, this thing, you can kind of view, it gets hydrolyzed. It releases energy. We know that ATP is the energy currency of biological systems. So let me draw it. So it releases energy. I draw, I'm drawing it as like a little spark or explosion. But you can really imagine it as it's changing the conformation of it kind of spring loads this protein right here to go into a state so it's ready to, to kind of crawl along the myosin. So in step two, so plus energy, energy, and then this, you can kind of say it cocks, it cocks the myosin protein or enzyme to high energy. You can kind of imagine it kind of winds the spring or, or loads the spring to high energy conformation. And conformation for proteins just means shape. Conformation. So the step two, what happens is this: the, the phosphate group gets, they're still attached, but it gets detached from the rest of the ATP. So that becomes ADP. And then that energy changes the conformation so that this protein now goes into a position that looks like this. And let me draw it like, so this is, this is where we end up at the end of step two. Let me make sure I do it right. So at the end of step two, it might look something like this. It looks something like this. Uh, I'm trying my best to draw it. So at the end of step two, the protein looks something like this. This is kind of in its cocked position. It has a lot of energy right now. It's kind of wound up in this position. You still have your ADP. You still have your, that's your adenosine. And then let's say you have your two phosphate groups on the ADP, and you still have one phosphate group right there. Now, when that phosphate group releases, so then let me write this as step three. So that the, remember, when we started, we were just sitting here. At the ATP kind of binds on step one, or actually it does definitely bind. At the end of step one, it re, that causes the myosin protein to get released. Then, after step one, we get, well, we naturally have step two. Of the, the ATP hydrolyzes into ADP phosphate. That releases energy. And that allows the, the myosin protein to get cocked into this high energy position and kind of attach, you can kind of think of it, to the next rung, to the next run of our actin filament. Now we're ready to kind of, we're in a high energy state when, let me write this down, in step three, in step three, the phosphate releases released from myosin. The phosphate is released from myosin in step three. That's step three right there. That's a phosphate group being released. And what this does is this releases that energy of that cocked position, and it causes, it causes this myosin protein to push on the actin. This is the power stroke, if you imagine in an engine. This is what's causing the mechanical movement. So when the phosphate group is actually released, remember, the, the original release is when you take ATP to ADP in a phosphate. That put it in this kind of spring-loaded position. When the phosphate releases it, this releases the spring. Releases the spring. This is releases the spring. And what that does is it pushes on the actin filament. It pushes on actin filament, pushes on actin. So you could view this as the power stroke. We're actually creating mechanical energy. So depending on which one you want to view as fixed, if you view the actin as fixed, whatever myosin is attached to would move to the left. If the, you imagine the myosin being fixed, then whatever the actin and whatever it's attached to would move to the right. Either way. But this is where we fundamentally get the muscle action. And then step four, and then step four, you have the ADP released, A, ADP released, and then we're exactly where we were. We're exactly where we were before we did step one, except we're just one rung further to the left on the actin on the actin molecule. So to me, this is pretty amazing. We actually are seeing how ATP energy can be used to, you know, we're going from chemical energy. Let me write that down. We're going from chemical energy or bond energy in ATP chemical energy to mechanical energy, mechanical 
energy. And I, I, for me, that's amazing, because when I first learned about ATP, and people say, oh, they use ATP to do everything in your cells and contract muscles, I thought, well, gee, how do you go from bond energy to actually contracting things, to actually doing you know, what we see in our everyday world as mechanical energy? And this is really where it all occurs. This is really the core issue that's going on here. And you have to say, well, gee, how does this thing change shape and all of that. And, and you have to remember, these proteins, based on what's bonded to it and what's not bonded to it, they change shape. And some of those shapes take more energy to attain. And then if, if you kind of do the right things, that energy can be released. And then it can push another protein. But I find this just fascinating. And now we can build up from this actin and myosin interactions to understand how muscles actually work. Okay. Uh, so is that all fine? Did you all guys get what we are trying to explain in the video? Any questions? So, sir, this is that structure. Yeah, this is the structure that we are talking about. This is the myosin chain. Both of that line of what it is, actin filament will come together and stick to the myosin. And when it got stretched, both of the actin filament can go away from each other. So, in the normal conditions, this is what a relaxed state of the muscle looks like where we have a least amount of overlap between the uh, myosin and the actin. Once the process of contraction starts, what we have is something like this. So here you can see the myosin heads which are intertwined amongst each other. So we have a lot of myosin and a lot of myosin heads are attached to these positions in the actin. So these are the active sites of the actin molecule where the myosin is linked. Once the contraction starts, the myosin goes from this state to this state, which as you can see right here is as if pushing on the actin. This movement is known as the power stroke. And once this movement has occurred, the myosin will return to its original relaxed state but one uh, one rung or one actin filament further as you can see or one active site further and this is what co controls the contraction of the entire system so we, we have myosin we have the myosin head connected to the actin filament. The first step is ATP hydrolysis, which causes the myosin head to essentially stretch out in this direction and then push back and go to the next rung and then get stuck there, essentially moving one step forward. This is the nanomolecular assembly that causes contraction. So once you imagine that there are this is just one actin myosin filament that are connected to each other. There are thousands and thousands of it joined together to form the myofibrils, even more to form the muscle fiber, and finally even more to form the muscles. So we have a small uh, energy or small mechanical energy development at this nanomolecular scale, which then gets amplified and amplified to the macromolecular scale because of the arrangement of the entire thing. So all of them are parallel to each other, all of them are generating force at the one at once, and that causes the contraction in this huge structure. Is this fine? Yes, sir. Okay. Anyone else wants to ask anything from this?
so uh, we had a lot of discussion about this uh, but uh, you know going back to our question that you initially asked actin and myosin are proteins okay if no one has any question we're moving forward if anyone wants to ask anything about this because this is the most important aspect of the entire or uh, this week's lecture how is that actin and myosin work together to uh, generate force and help in contraction of muscles I'm not getting any kind of doubt about this. Okay, Vinayak. You can move. Okay. I guess if anyone has any doubt, we can put it into the text. I will be moving forward to the next question. Satellite cells are dash and dash. The options are stem cells that differentiate to monocytes. A myocytes, fully differentiated cells that are derived from myocytes, fully differentiated cells that differentiate to myocytes, stem cells that are derived from myocytes. So you have four options. You can put whatever you think is correct in the chat. A, B, C, D. Tom Day says it is A, stents is differentiated to monocytes, myocytes. Anyone else? Okay, Tripti, do you have any question? No, sir. Okay. Oh, uh, anyone else wants to try and answer this? Satellite cells are dash and dash. Options are stem cells differentiate to myocytes, fully differentiated cells derived from myocytes, fully differentiated cells differentiate to myocytes, and stem cells that are derived from myocytes. Atik says it is A. Kamlesh also says it is A. Stem cells differentiate to myocytes. Anyone else wants to try? Okay, so, so we'll have to understand a bit more about this. So muscles, uh, the image that we just saw, we'll go back to it. These are what the entire muscle fiber looks like. But there are another type of cells that are associated with these muscles. These are called satellite cells, which essentially sit on top of various regions in the muscles. So what are these satellite cells? These are stem cells that can go two types of division. First is known as an asymmetric division. These cells can form another of themselves, another satellite cell and a myocyte. This myocyte will go into the muscle layer and repair any damaged or dead myocytes or, and take their place. So while day-to-day -day work, our muscles can get damaged, wear and tear and cause uh, certain cells to die off. These satellite cells are present there to take their place. So each myocyte that dies, these satellite cells can go ahead and uh, divide and form another myocyte to take its place. It can occur asymmetrically in which our uh, stem cell or satellite cell remains uh, like produces another satellite cell or can occur symmetrically in which case they can either self renew like one satellite cell forming another two more satellite cells or can completely form two different monos uh, myocytes 
so this d can go asymmetric division one satellite one myocyte or symmetric divisions one satellite two satellite cells to regain the population of spent satellite cells or a complete asymmetric division a completely symmetric division to form two myocytes to take up uh, to replace more and more of damaged muscle cells this occurs when there is a lot of damage to the muscles so satellite cells or stem cells is that okay yes sir okay can anyone tell me what these things are back seven mif 5 here we have one in one kind of division we have pac 7 positive mif 5 negative another type of division we have pac 7 positive and mif 5 positive can anyone tell me what these are exactly what this symbol mean Anyone has any idea about what these are? Okay, so PAC7 and MIF5 are transcription factors. Transcription factors are certain uh, transcription factors are certain proteins which help in transcription of new genes in a particular cell. So PAC7 is essentially a marker for all the muscle progeny. But MIF5 if is only present in cells which are actively going to differentiate into myocytes. But they are absent in case of progenitors or stem cells. That is why in case of a symmetric division into more stem cells, we have MIF5 off. So these cells only form progenitors. But in case of symmetric division into new myocytes that are differentiated, MIF5 is turned on. So that they form myocytes, not satellite cells. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So a quick dive into this. So what exactly are stem cells? So we have talked about that the satellite cells are stem cells. Stem cells are any cell that can, that shows two properties. One, that it can divide indefinitely. Two, that it can divide to form itself again or something known as a self-renewal property. So satellite cells are stem cells because you can see that they have a self-renewable property and stem cells have there are different categories of stem cells depending on how many types of other cells they can form the satellite cells that we just saw can only form one type of other cells which is the myocytes but there are other more powerful stem cells the biggest example is the totipotent cell which is the zygote. This can form every other kind of cell in our body, including itself. So it is known as totipotent. Next, we have pluripotent. These are cells from the inner lining of the embryo at a very early stage, which is known as blastocyst. And this inner cell mass can essentially form any cell in our body again. And it's known as pluripotent. As development occurs, the embryo grows, the stem cells continue to differentiate into other uh, cells which actually have a function. 
they do not remain as a undifferentiated mass. In this process, they lose their potency or the ability to form new cell types. So we reach at a stage where the stem cells are all multipotent, which can form multiple cell types, but not as many as pluripotent cells. And multipotent cells examples are ectodermal, mesodermal, endodermal cells, which can give rise to different types of cells, but not like grow, go diagonally like this. They only form these type of cells. Ectodermal cells form the neurons and the epithelial cells. Mesodermal forms the red blood cells and the cardiomyocytes. And finally, the endodermal cells form the liver cells and the pancreas cells or the inner lining cells. So these are multipotent stem cells. And finally, we reach down the ladder to finally unipotent cells, which only give rise to one type of cells. The prime example being the satellite cells that we just talked about. Yes, are, yeah. Are we all okay with this? Yes. Anyone else has any questions about this and potency and stem cells? They are having property to regenerate. Yes, they have the property to self renew, that is, form themselves again, and property to replicate or divide as many times as possible. These are the two important properties that stem cells should have. Okay, if no one has any questions, we'll be looking for going forward. So, this is an example of two types of divisions the stem cells can do. One is a symmetric division, as we saw right here. One stem cell forming two new stem cells, or one stem cell forming two differentiated progeny, or a symmetric cell division, one cell stem cell giving rise to another stem cell and a differentiated progeny. Mm -hmm. So we both have self renewal as well as differentiation in this stage. Okay, so the options satellite cells are dash and dash. They are stem cells that differentiate to myocytes. Okay, anyone has any questions from this? No, sir. Okay. Anyone else wants to ask anything from this? Okay, Vishwadi thought this is no, I guess this is clear. We will be moving forward. In skeletal muscle, which of the following prevents interaction between actin and myosin? The options are myotube, actin, tropomyosin, or troponin. So there are four options A, B, C, D. Anyone wants, to, you can put whatever you think is the correct answer in the chat. Vinas is it is C, tropomyosin. Everybody else? Vishwajit also says it is C. Atik says C. Kamlesh also says it is C. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Anthra also says it is C, tropomyosin. Anyone else? Almadina also says it is C, tropomyosin. Okay. Uh, so we have another video which you will not be able to hear from here. So I will go. There. Okay. 
just let me know if you can hear this. In the last video, we learned how myosin. Can you hear this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. In the last video, we learned how myosin and myosin 2 in particular, when we say myosin 2, it actually has two of these myosin heads and their tails are interwound with each other. How myosin 2 can use ATP to essentially, you can also almost imagine either pulling an actin filament or walking up an actin filament. It starts attached. ATP comes and bonds onto it. That causes it to be released. Then the ATP hydrolyzes into ATP and, or sorry, into ADP and a phosphate group. And when that happens, that energy is released. This puts this into a higher energy state. It kind of spring loads the protein, and then it attaches up another notch on the actual actin filament. And then the phosphate group leaves, and that's where the conformation change in this protein is enough. It, it generates the power stroke to actually push on the actin filament. And either you can imagine either move the myosin, whatever the myosin is connected to, to the to the left, or whatever the actin is connected to, to the right. And we're going to talk a lot more about what they're connected to in future videos. Now, a couple of questions might have been raising in your head. You know, this guy had so much effort to pull on this thing, right? There, there's probably some tension pulling in the other direction, right? This is, I said that this is what happens in muscles. So there must be some weight or some other resistance. So what happens when this releases? You know, when, when, when it, at, at the, the first step when ATP joined and this released, wouldn't the, actin, wouldn't the actin filament just go back to where it was before, especially if there's some tension on it going in that direction? And the simple answer to that is, this isn't the only myosin uh, 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 protein that's acting on this, on this actin. You have others all along the chain. Maybe you have one right there. Maybe you have one right there. And they're all working at their own pace at different times. So you have so many of these that when one of them is disengaged, another one of them might be in their power stroke, or another one might be engaged. So it's not like you have this notion of, if all of a sudden one lets go, that the actin filament will recoil back to where it was. Now the next question that you might be thinking is, how do I turn on and off this situation? You know, I, we have command over our muscles. What what can turn on or off this system of the myosin uh, essentially crawling up the actin? And to understand that, there's two other proteins that come into effect. And that's tropomyosin and tropomin. Troponin. Tropo. Let me write this down. Tropomyosin. Tropo. Tropomyosin myosin in a different color, I'll write troponin. Troponin. And so I'm going to redraw the actin. I'll do a very rough drawing of the actin filament. Let's say that that's my actin filament right there with its little grooves. It's actually a helical structure. Let's say it looks like this, like that. Well, that's close enough. And actually, these grooves, you know, it's a kind of a helical structure. But we won't worry too much about that. What we drew so far, at least in the last video, you had, you had, little, you have these little myosin. You can view them as feet or head or whatever you that, that keep attaching to it, and then based on where they are in that ATP cycle, they can keep getting cranked back up or the spring loaded, and then go to the next one and push back. Now, on top of this actin, you actually have this tropomyosin protein, and this tropomyosin protein, it it for, it it coils around the actin. So let me draw the trop. So this is our actin right here. This is the my this is one of the two heads of the myosin 2 myosin and then we have our tropomyosin tropomyosin is coiled around it's a very rough sketch but you can imagine it's coiled around then it goes back behind it then it goes like that and then it goes back behind it and it goes like that so it's coiled around it and the important thing about it is if there's well, let me let me make let me take a step back. It's coiled around it, and it's attached to the actin at by another protein called troponin. So this is the troponin. Let me draw. So let's say it's attached there, and you know this isn't exact, but let's say it's attached there, and there, and there, and there, and there by the troponin. So let me write this down. This is troponin, troponin, and then this is tropomyosin. Tro, po myosin. 
So you can imagine the tropamin, troponin is kind of like the nails into the actin. So it dictates where the tropomycin is. So in, when, it, when a muscle is not contracting, it turns out that these that the tropomyosin is blocking the myosin from being able to, and, and I've read a bunch of accounts on this, and I think this is a, still a, an area of research. It's not 100% clear one way or the other. Tropomyosin is, or maybe both, blocking the myosin from being able to attach to the actin where it normally attaches so it won't be able to crawl up the actin. Or it, sometimes the myosin is attached to the actin, but it keeps it from sliding, from releasing and sliding up the actin to keep that walking procedure. So the bottom line is, is that this tropomyosin kind of uh, blocks the myosin, blocks the myosin, the myosin, write this, the myosin head. This is the myosin head right there. This is the myosin head that I'm talking about from crawling up the actin. From crawling from crawling up the actin, either by physically bonding, blocking its actual binding site, or if it's already bound, from keeping it from being able to keep sliding up the actin. Either way, it's blocking it. And the only way to make it unblocked is for the troponins to actually change their conformation, for them to change their shape. And the only way for them to change their shape is if we have a high calcium ion concentration. So if you have a bunch of calcium ions, so if you have calcium ions, what they do, if you have a high enough concentration, these calcium ions are going to bond to the troponin. They're going to bond to the troponin. And then that changes the conformation of the troponin enough to move the configuration of the tropomyosin. So let me write this down. So normally, tropomyosin blocks. But then when you have a high calcium, high calcium ion concentration, they, they bind to troponin, troponin, and then the troponin, and then the troponin, they, they change their conformation, so it moves the tropomyosin out of the way moves tropomyosin out of the way, out of the way. So when it moves out of the way, you have a high concentration, calcium concentration, bonds to troponin, moves tr tropomyosin out of the way. Then all of a sudden, what we talked about in the last video, these guys can start walking up the actin, or, the, or pushing the actin to the right, however you want to view it. But then if the calcium concentration goes low, so low calcium ion concentration. Then the calciums get released from the troponin. You have, need to have enough to always hang around here. If the concentration becomes really low here, these guys will start to leave. So then the troponin, troponin goes back to, I guess, standard conformation. Goes back to the standard conformation. And that makes. The tropomyosin can block block the myosin again. Makes tropomyosin block again. So it's actually, I mean, you know, I can't say anything here is simple. This uh, this was only discovered maybe 50 or 60 years ago, and you could imagine to actually observe these things or to create experiments to make this to, to definitively know what's happening. Nothing is simple, but the idea is simple. In the presence, in, without calcium. The tropomyosin is blocking the ability of the myosin to attach where it needs to attach or slide up the actin so that it can, it can keep pushing on it. But if the calcium concentration is high enough, they will bond to the troponin, which essentially nails down the, the tropomyosin that's wound around the actin. And, it, and, and when they change their conformation with the calcium ions, it moves, it moves the tropomyosin out of the way so that the myosin can do what it does. So you can imagine already, we're, we're building up a, a, a way for, one, for muscles to contract, but even better for us to control muscles to contract. So if we have a high calcium concentration within the cell, the muscle will contract. If we have a low calcium concentration again, then all of a sudden, these will release, they'll be blocked, and then the muscle will relax again. We know from the last video. <clears throat> okay, that was very interesting. 
I hope you also found that interesting and uh, if you have any questions from that, you can ask me right away. So essentially what happens, I hope you can see my screen. My screen is visible. Hello. No. So in the relaxed conformation where there is no calcium ions present, then this is what the configuration of actin and tropomyosin looks like. Actin is arranged in two helical bundles like this with the tropomyosin coming in and covering all the active sites where myosin might interact with actin. In the presence of high calcium, there is another molecule known as troponin which can bind to tropomyosin. And in presence of high calcium, it does so and removes the tropomyosin from the active sites, allowing for the interaction between myosin and actin and all the actin-myosin mechanics to occur that we just saw in our previous discussion which allows for muscles to contract. This is essentially the idea behind tropomyosin preventing actin from interacting with myosin. So, which of the following prevents interaction between actin and myosin? The correct answer is tropomyosin. So, there are, this particular scheme is not specific to only skeletal muscles. If you know about intracellular uh, transport then uh, say when our cells make different organelles or different cargoes and it has to reach from one end to another for example say in case of nerve cells which are huge cells these long cells have nuclei at one end and their uh, processes reach another end which are really millimeters apart but all the formation of most of the things occurs near the nucleus. So if an essential component has to reach all the way to its end, then the, all the cargoes have to travel somehow. This travel, occur, uh, this travel occurs on a network of microtubules or the cytoskeleton, where again, we have a similar mechanism by, by which myosin can be used to essentially pull the entire cargo from one end of the cell to another. The same uh, mechanism occurs in which the head of the myosin engages with the microtubules and moves forward like this with the cargo in, on its tail. So there are very beautiful animations and super resolution microscopy images that you can watch on YouTube which I'm not going into, but you can watch them. And though they are very, very cool looking and you can you know, study more about them. So any questions from the particular discussion? Anyone has anything? Yes, so we can move further. Okay. Okay. Moving forward, which of the following is not a component of skeletal muscle force dynamics? The options are calcium ions, actin myosin, tropomyosin troponin, or notes of Ranvier. You can put in the answer in the chat. Kamlesh says it is D, Vishwajit also says it is D, Atik says it is D, Tripti also follows, say it is D. That is notes of Ranvier. Tanushi also says D. Al Madina also is with the nodes of Ranvier. Anyone else? Sir, I am having one kind of out of syllabus question. Yes, you can go ahead. Sir, uh, we were having the exam on 31st of October. No, since we were having that exam. Uh, we are going to give online, no, like uh, CET and NEET. In, NEET. in NEET, we are going to write the paper. And in uh, CET, uh, we had just uh, got the MCQs on the computer. So, uh, 
आर वी गोइंग टू राइट द पेपर इन ऑफलाइन मोड और लाइक सीईटी ओनली सो हाउ एनपीटीएल ऑर्गेनाइजेस इट्स एग्जाम्स आर द देयर आर डिफरेंट एग्जाम सेंटर्स इन डिफरेंट बिग सिटीज इन व्हिच यू हैव टू ट्रैवल टू एंड इन दैट पर्टिकुलर एग्जाम सेंटर द you have to pre- be present at the exam center and the exam will be online it will be mostly mcq type of a question answer situation like your assignment questions but it will be only be you will only be allowed to give the exam at the exam center so you have, will have to travel uh, for a bit and then 70 70 marks no 70 marks yes 70 marks from will be from your final exam and uh, 30 marks internal that assignments yes period. yes but you have passing marks for both the assignment and the uh, final exam so you will have to score a minimum of i think 15 or 10 in the assignments and minimum of 35 or something in the 70 marks questions okay everything is available on the nptel site and there are videos also explaining everything so you can just check them out Okay. Coming back to this, which of the following is not a component of skeletal muscle force dynamics? The options are calcium ions, actinomycin, tropomerin, and tropomyosin, or some nodes of Ranvier. Okay, we now equal to this D. Anyone else wants to try? Okay, and there also says deep. Nice. So we have another video on this, but I will not be going into this. This is uh, this is uh, something similar to what we have seen. This just talks about more about the calcium and troponin complex interaction. You can just watch them when you uh, get the PowerPoint on your end. But uh, yeah, so I will not be going into this because we just covered this. Which of the following is not a component of skeletal muscle force dynamics? The obvious answer is nodes of Ranvier, because everything else we have just seen is very involved in force generation. Can anyone tell me what the nodes of Ranvier are actually involved in? Impulse transmission. Yes. Who was that? Mm. Nice. You are correct, Tripti. It is uh, nodes of Ranvier represent in nerve cells and help in fast transmission of impulses, as we will be looking into as we will see in the next uh, set of videos on the NPTEL website. How exactly nerve conduction occurs? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the next question is: the length of the sarcomere is. Length of the I band, length of the A band, length of I band divided by length of A band, or the distance between the two Z lines. So sarcomere we have just uh, we have discussed a bit before is the smallest unit in the muscle cell which help in contraction. So what is the length of the sarcomere? How will you measure it? So you have four options A, B, C, D. You can put in whatever you think is the correct answer. Vishwaji says D, uh, distance between two Z lines. Anyone else wants to try? Atik also says it is D. Al Madina also says it is D. Antar also says it is D. Distance between the two Z lines. Tanushi also goes for D. Distance between the two Z lines. Anyone else? Tripti also says it is D. Distance between two Z lines. Okay, let us look at it. So this is a simplified diagram for the sarcomere. So sarcomere consists of 
multiple different uh, molecules. The first is being the myosin, which is present in the middle, right here. These are myosins and actins, which are uh, also present, essentially interlinked between the myosins. The actins are directly linked towards a base plate, essentially, where everything is connected, which is known as the Z disk. And the myosin is connected to the Z disk via another protein known as titin. Titin is actually the heaviest known protein and acts as a spring-like system so that when the muscles are not uh, in a contracted position they automatically relax between because the spring essentially pulls the actin away from the myosin so they have different bands present uh, so depending on where you are looking at you can see different bands present in the entire structure the middle of it where light can pass through easily with no overlap of myosin actin is known as the h zone the the places where we have only titan present no actin myosin uh, overlap is known as the i zone and finally we have the z disk that we have already seen where everything is uh, attached in the b split and in the contracted for position you see that the actin person moves like this they interlink among it themselves and there is increase in overlap between the actin person so the size of the i band uh, so the size of the this actin person overlap increases so our striation increases but the middle remains the same so this is what the contracted sarcomere looks like and the distance between the two ends of the sarcomere are the distance between the two base plates, which are the distance between the two Z disk. So, to answer the, our question, the length of the sarcomere is the distance between the two Z lines. Moving on, the next question is which of these has no active? The options are A zone, I zone, H zone, or AI zone. A, B, C, D, you can put whatever you think is the correct answer in here. I band. Okay, we now access I band. Anyone else? I think it says B, it is the I band. Anyone else who wants to try and answer this? So it has no actin. Al Medina says H zone, which is option C. Tripti also says C, H zone. Antara also follows saying it is H zone, option C. Anyone else? Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Okay, so this is another image of the sarcomere. Uh, here we can see again all the different parts of it uh, so these are the z lines shown like this we have the actin and the myosin in the middle with the titan joining the myosin to the z lines so here uh, if we are to name different bands the middle of it will be the m line where the myosins are attached 
the middle of the line from going perpendicular to the thick filament of the myosin. The overlap between the actin and the myosin covers the A band. The I band covers the part where titan and actin are overlapping. And finally, the H zone or the H band is the part where there is no overlap between the actin and the myosin. So here you can see the H zone right here. No overlap between the actin and the myosin. This is the part. And A band covers the entirety of the overlap of the actin and myosin. So the correct option is H zone. And so you can see right here, middle of the portion, no overlap between actin and myosin. Which of this has no actin? And the answer is H zone, part C. Sir, what we will call to that uh, black lines which uh, restricts both the I bands, uh, Z disk and Z disk, uh, which uh, prevents uh, what it is collapsing this bla black black neutron. Mm -hmm. What is the particular uh, term or name for it? These, this is the M line. See, this is the M line right here. Yeah, yeah, this is the M line. This is essentially a structure made out of myosin that joins all the myosin strands together and looks like this. Okay. So it is the H band. Final question of the day the sarcomere length dash when actually. Yeah, yes, yes. Sir, can you explain it once again? Because uh, I band can be also the option. Yeah, so uh, we'll go one by one. So first we have M band, which is M line, which is present in the middle, which goes perpendicularly via the thick myosin filaments. Then we have the A band right here, which covers all the actin myosin overlap from here to here then we have the eighth zone which has no actin only myosin then we have the z disks which indicate the end of the sarcomere and finally the i band if you look at the i band it looks at the distance between one myosin to the other myosin this is the region where only actin and titan is present, right? This region. There is no myosin in the I band. So if I aim it right here, it will be this region. This will be the I band. So it only covers actin and titan. Our question was, which of these has no actin? So I band has actin. Our A band also has actin. The M line and the eighth zone are the only ones which do not have any actin in it. It only has myosin. So the correct answer is eighth zone, not I band. Is that okay? Okay, sir. Yeah. Final questions of, of the night. The sarcomere length dash when actin myosin overlap. The options are increases, decreases, is unchanged and none of the above decreases okay option b from vinayak anyone else wants to try i think also says option b which one is also goes for uh, option b tanushti also follows with option b tripti also says it is option b Anyone else? Antara also says it is option B. Okay. So we just quickly go back to our image of the sarcomere. You can see that length of the sarcomere is determined by the length of the Z disks, uh, the distance between the Z disks. So when uh, the muscle contracts, we have overlap between the Z disks 
uh, or the actin myosin and they contract like this and this contraction essentially brings the both my knuckles together which here imitate the z disc and you have them coming close together essentially the distance between the uh, z discs decrease and essentially sarcomere length decreases so the sarcomere length decreases when actin mass overlap okay anyone has any questions from this no sir uh, sir yes sir can you explain a uh, uh, what is difference between band and uh, uh, zone okay so essentially these are anatomical features which were looked up upon very very early when people first were looking at slices of the muscle under the microscope the band and the zone nomenclature actually follows from the fact that you can see the light and dark regions in the muscle so here you can see the light and dark regions where there is no overlap such as the eye band you see it being light and here you will see it being dark the zone nomenclature came later when you have a much more advanced microscope which can actually determine where these ends but essentially there is no hard and fast rule which will be a band which will be a zone this is just what the nomenclature has been we have been following for a long time okay yeah. oh, sir i am having one doubt yes when we complete our assignment after the due date gone okay mm -hmm. so on that time we, the marks are going to be revealed now in the progress uh, section yes yes course. So for two assignment I got the marks mm -hmm. uh, and then the third and fourth now uh, I had submitted but I didn't got marks so I asked you this question. The, the submission date for the third and fourth are coming up in the next week. So after the submission is over and the everything is done then you will get your marks. But third is submission is uh, tomorrow only 14th of and for fourth. Assessment submission 21st they are given date. Okay, so like after the final date, that is third, you will like tomorrow you will get the marks for the assignment. That is what I meant. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. So the sarcomere length decreases when actin mass and overlap. That is all I had from you all uh, for you all today. Since we have time, we can go through the final video here. Uh, and we'll just quickly end on this. C. I'm going to draw. Just let me know if you can hear For you, the heart. And we're going to actually do a little bit of zooming in now, taking a look at exactly what... Can you hear this? What? Uh, yeah. Hello? Yes. Uh, so can I have you? Yes, I guess you can leave if you want to. This video can be available on the, what it is, Google Drive, no? Yes, yes, it will be available. We can just see this video afterwards too. Because my full battery is draining over there, 8%. Yes, okay, it's all. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. What happens both in the wall of the heart, but also going even further in. So, let's start with the heart wall. What, what would you see if you were to kind of zoom in? You might see heart cells and this is kind of a heart cell with some branches here and you remember a heart cell besides just having branches to kind of make it very distinct looking it has sometimes one but also sometimes two nuclei. 
Now let's say we were to zoom in again on this heart cell. What would we see if we, we kind of went further? Well, you know that there are lots and lots and lots of proteins inside that heart cell. And the ones we usually have been concerning ourselves with are the actin and myosin. These are the kind of classic cell uh, proteins that allow it to contract. So it might look a little bit like this, right, with our, our actins kind of spaced out a little bit from each other. I'll label it as I go. This is our actin. And in the middle of the actin, you've got myosin, right? So you've got this purple myosin, and it looks maybe something like this with little myosin heads hanging off of it. And you've got some on both sides. And these myosins are going to be tethered to the wall, right? This, this wall at the end, and I'll draw that tethering with green. This might be something like that. And this is basically known as titan. This protein titan is what kind of keeps the myosin from, from drifting away, you could think of it as. Well, what happens over time is that these myosins and actins are going to start binding, right? They're going to start binding to one another, and we call these actin-myosin cross bridges, or you might hear different terms, but basically the two are interacting with each other. And what the myosin is going to want to do is it's going to want to yank this way, right? It's going to want to bind to the actin like this and yank it that way. And in fact, all of these little myosins are going to kind of act the same way. They're going to want to yank the uh, actin in the same direction. And on the opposite side, you've got pulling in the opposite way, right? You've got pulling uh, towards the middle, basically. So if this was to work, what would happen? Well, at the edges here, these things right here, we call these Z-discs. Z disk. You might have heard the, the term Z line because it looks like a line under a microscope. But if you actually kind of zoom in and you, you could you know go up close to it, it's basically a disk of protein, right? So these Z, Z disks, if, uh, if our actins and myosins are indeed kind of interacting and, and tugging on one another the way that we think they should, these are going to be pulled inwards, right? It's almost like kind of bringing a, a wall in towards the center. You can kind of think of it that way. And you can kind of think of the actin as like a rope hanging off of this Z-disc. And the myosin is literally kind of hands-on grabbing the rope and yanking on the disc. And in fact, lots and lots of myosin heads are doing it all at once, kind of in unison. So that's why these discs get moved towards the center. And when they get moved towards the center, we literally call that contraction of the cell or cell contraction. And so these actin ropes, uh, if you want to keep thinking of them that way, are going to, of course, they're not going to get cut or shrunk or anything. They're going to be the same length. But the Z discs get brought closer together. So overall, the effect is that the entire thing looks a little bit more crowded because the myosin has kind of brought everything to the center. So that's cell contraction. Now, I'm going to actually take a, a little uh, further zoom in. Let's say you actually wanted to zoom in. I mean, let's look at two of these. Let's say you wanted to zoom into something like this, this white box here, and kind of take a look at what that might look like. Let's see that. I'm going to make a little bit of space on my canvas. But let's just keep that scene like that. Let me start by drawing the acting. It'll look something like this. And I'm going to try to keep it somewhat consistent so you can actually see what it is that we're going to try to draw along the way. So we've got our actin and we've got our myosin. And our myosin I'm going to orient kind of in the same direction as oriented in the other picture. So something like this. Let's say it's one head there and let's say you've got our second head right there, right? So you've got our myosin. And of course our myosin is going to continue in uh, really in both directions but, but really it's uh, the majority of the myosin is going to be that way, right? So we've got our actin, we've got our myosin. And the story uh, from the previous picture kind of ends there, but we know that we've got our uh, myosin actin bi binding sites are going to be kind of bound up by tropomyosin, right? Tropomyosin is kind of snaking its way through. Looks a little bit like that, right? And it's going to basically be sitting in all of the uh, binding sites so that myosin really can't get in there. And in fact, there's also Another protein, we, we talked about the fact that there's a protein called troponin. And troponin is also kind of in the same area. I'm actually going to draw troponin like this. 
And you might be thinking, why am I drawing troponin in three parts? Why is there you know, a little crescent-shaped thing and then also two little circles? And actually, troponin, even though before, previously we talked about troponin kind of as one protein, this whole thing, is uh, probably more commonly known as troponin complex. So instead of just the one word troponin, it's actually a complex of proteins. And there are three, to be precise. There's troponin C over here, I, and T. And in fact, if that's not clear, let me put it on this side right here so you can see it. So there's troponin C, troponin I, and troponin T. And in yellow, we've got our tropomycin. So now our picture is looking a little bit more accurate, right? We've got all of this stuff going on with the tropomycin getting in the way of our myosin head. Now, what's going to make that troponin complex move away? What's going to kind of clear space for our myosin head? Well, we know that it's going to be calcium. And I'm going to draw calcium here binding to which part of the troponin complex? Well, the troponin C, C like calcium, is what's going to bind the calcium. So troponin C is going to bind calcium. And once it does, once the calcium is bound there, it then can scooch the, tropo, uh, the, the tropomycin out of the way. So now the tropomycin, I'm going to just draw with some green arrows, is going to basically be scooched out of the way. And the myosin head is very happy because it can bind finally to the actin. Now, if there's no calcium, like you can see in our friend to the right, this troponin, uh, sorry, this troponin is not going to bind to the calcium. So the uh, tropomyosin is not moved out of the way. It's in the way. And at the end of the day, the myosin is going to be sad because it cannot bind to that actin. So you can see now the, the myosin, from a myosin standpoint, it likes when calcium is around because that means it can do work. Now let me clear a little bit more space for us, and I'm going to bring up one final point. I mean, if we think that uh, a happy myosin head is a working myosin head, if we take that approach, uh, it's a little bit like, I guess, uh, getting a job, right? You know, it makes everyone happy when they have a job, when they're employed. And myosin heads are no different. They want to be employed. And so how do you employ myosin heads? How do you get more jobs for myosin heads? Well, there are basically two strategies for increasing what we call inotropy, or basically uh, getting more myosin heads working. So two strategies. Let's go through them one by one. So the first strategy would be what? Well, you could uh, affect the amount of calcium, right? You could get more calcium around. That would be one strategy. And the other strategy might be you could have uh, the troponin C. Remember, the troponin C is part of the complex that's actually binding the calcium. You could get troponin C to be more sensitive to calcium. More, and I'm going to put that in quotes because what do I mean by sensitive? Well, essentially, you're saying that troponin C uh, could change its shape or its conformation to bind the calcium that is already around more easily. So basically, bind calcium more easily. But I, I wanted to put the word sensitive because sometimes you'll, you'll see that word and you'll wonder what it means. So bind calcium more easily. So these are the two basic strategies. And you can imagine, you could imagine uh, you know, increasing uh, in one strategy, increasing the calcium, but leaving the uh, sensitivity of troponin C the same, really not changing uh, how easily it uh, will bind calcium. And the overall effect is more myosin heads are working. So more myosin heads are working. That would be the, the kind of overall effect, right? And you could flip it around. You could say, well, maybe, maybe you have uh, the same amount of calcium. Maybe you don't uh, actually increase the calcium, but you do make troponin C bind the calcium that is there more readily or more easily. Well, in that situation, you also get more myosin heads working, right? So in either scenario, in either strategy, you're going to get more myosin heads working. And so these are the two basic strategies for inotropy. ends our discussion on actin myosin dynamics i hope everyone is able to you know follow through if anyone has any questions you can ask now or we can just end the meeting today anyone has anything to ask
okay then thank you everyone for joining for today's uh, session see you next week thank you thank you sir